welcome back to the Popper Players Podcast. I'm Fursell. Thank you so much for joining me. If this is your first time joining me, I would understand. It's been a while since we've released an episode. However, historically, the philosophy of this podcast was to speak to the players who were shaping the metagame so that their voices could be heard. This episode's voice, Zimfly. He plays on MTGO as not good, but don't let that fool you. He recently won the Popper Super Qualifier outright by Driftin and Flickerin. so much for joining me could you tell us a bit about yourself yeah so i'm zipify or not good at magic online i am a popper player based in kansas and i'm mostly known for playing the familiar archetype on magic online now how did you get started playing magic in the first place and what got you into popper from there i started playing magic when i was uh seven so about 10 years ago now and uh, i got introduced when my dad showed me his old magic collection that he had i was kind of hooked onto it instantly uh so i mostly played standard for good six years and then uh, around 2016 2017 i saw this uh, mg goldfish video about popper this one they had the popper videos constantly and i was like man this format looks really interesting so i got into the format and i really enjoyed it i mostly played popper instead of standard for a while there and then I took a little bit of a break, and I came back after the uh, the Astrolabe ban. And uh, since then, I've just been playing Popper. What is it about Popper that draws you to it? Out of all the magic formats that you could choose to play, you're more or less a Popper specialist. Could you tell me why? Yeah, so I didn't really like Standard, or I don't really anymore, because all your cards really rotate out, which kind of sucks because then you have to buy a new deck always. I really like Popper just because of the, the eternal aspect of it. You have this giant card pool, and there are so many things you can try. Another thing that I really like is that the games are really grindy, you know? You have your flicker decks, you have your control decks, and I think that's what really makes me enjoy the format a lot. I just really love playing the grindy matchups, a lot of card advantage, and I think that's mostly why I play it. Well, I'm certainly a fan of grindy matchups. Anyone paying attention to the magic the gathering online may just see me at this time or have seen me by the time this is posted on the leaderboard of the artisan cube as it's called i do definitely enjoy you know sealed for that reason as well and i certainly used to really enjoy popper for those long drawn out games where we're going to battle over micro to small advantages until one person has enough of these said advantages working towards them to where they have won the game, right? Or have reached a position where the inevitability is thus granted. But what I find interesting is that you say you like Popper because it's an eternal format and you don't like Standard because it's a rotating format. Now, to play Devil's Advocate, if we look back since the printing of Astrolabe, right? You know, three or four months later, it gets banned. Mystic Sanctuary gets printed three or four months later it gets banned i'm going to skip over the banning of expedition map on this one i i could i listen i could i could i could go there but i'm going to skip over that ban it doesn't have the same weight as the others could be the safest if they're going to unban a card you know maybe expedition map could be their their easiest one on the on that list but fall to favor not long after that and then more recently Shatterstorm. So we actually have, unfortunately, I would argue, been playing a rotating format for the past two, maybe two and a half years. I mean, you're not entirely wrong, but I, I, I kind of disagree since, you know, you still have your, your same decks and uh, it's not like you have to buy a completely different deck every time something gets banned, you know, unless you bought Storm. That, that's a different story. Yeah, and also, depending on when you bought Storm, you may have done just fine on that, right? Stand, Sandstorm Needles 
went up to like seven and a half tickets there. So if you were the guy who got them at a dollar, then, you know, maybe it wasn't so bad when you had to get rid of them. Yeah, good value. And also you probably made off money off Storm anyways, so just to pay for the deck. <laughs> oh, no, 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 that totally fair deck that I can't imagine anyone having a profitable Magic the Gathering experience with, uh, you know, is... Uh, it's funny because I, I came very close to releasing content during the Storm era, just simply drawing the parallels between how many cards were in the Shatterstorm list and a deck that was called Mean Deck Sex. Affectionately, the had the moniker because it was Mean Deck X equals 10, and then somehow through early internet young male nonsense it got turned into mean deck sex but it's a 2005 vintage deck and there is a glaring amount of overlap in the cards in the chatter storm lists which you know fairly standardized list there's like one flex slot main and like some differently constructed sideboards i suppose but like yeah i mean the the deck was you know pretty solid and basically every common that was like legal in that was so much of that deck overlap right there's dark rituals there they had they had chromatic spheres right chromatic star had not been printed so they had chromatic sphere and they actually played six copies of it effectively using dark water egg which hey chatterstorm does this sound familiar to you chatterstorm you're playing four star and two sphere when you're playing they had dark rituals and cabal rituals they had night whispers they had brainstorms right okay so ponder had not been printed preordain had not been printed but they had brainstorms it was just incredibly similar right not just just the amount of overlap between those two decks but just the play style right of needing to get up to effectively four mana and storm 10 and being more or less all in in route to doing so so Almost walked down a little down uh, memory lane with that one because that was one of the first. Well, it was one of the first decks. Listen, when I was your age, right? Like that deck that I'm discussing in vintage mattered a lot more, basically. Right. So yeah, no, maybe it's not the best content. So like, I didn't actually release this, but like, there was a lot of overlap, man. And so effectively, I don't think that we are playing a rotating format with pomper it's just an unnecessary byproduct of this thing called power creep which we're seeing growing pains within other formats and we're just getting sort of the that card was really good in draft effect yeah it's like every new uh supplemental product like commander legends or modern horizons comes out it's new card that needs to be banned and it's just like really annoying at this point except for those expedition maps those were always a problem <laughs> what do you mean fruit style the card was never banned no there's no way that card is banned i don't think it belongs on that list necessarily either but that's not really the point of this discussion the point of this podcast again is to or was rather historically to speak to the players who were shaping the metagame so let's i do want to actually focus on that and I, I, let's talk familiars right and this is you know awfully reminiscent of previous episodes of the podcast in which we had cali on who plays blue white familiars goes by a different name on mtgo as he does everything else so this is seeming very very familiar to me at least and yeah, pun intended. The thing is, your guys' deck lists hasn't changed that much, much since he was on this podcast. How much of this deck is standardized at this point? How much of it is metagame dependent slash flex spots main? And then we'll have a separate conversation about Cyborg. All right. So the stock cards for sure in familiars right now are probably Ephemerate, Mole Drifter, uh, Archaeomancer, Secret Oracle, some amount of counter, some kind of counterspell like Prohibit or actual counterspell, Preordains, Ghostly Flicker, and Snaps. Those are definitely the straight cards you need to be playing. Uh, the Flex Sots right now, it, there's not that many, but right now I have one E Truth instead of another Snap, some more Cantrips, so I have two Ponders. Kelly's been trying Brainstorm, but I've been liking Ponder. Faithfuls. So it really, it's really meta dependent. Uh, right now, there's a lot of fairies, so I have four faithful, and having two faithful can usually keep you alive for a long, for long enough against uh, fairies. And deep analysis. The most comparable card to deep analysis is probably compulsive research, but right now deep analysis is just the better card since 
there's a lot of fairies as well. So those are really just the flex slots. I guess you can also say Chance Ray is a flex card as well, but there's not a whole lot of LD right now going around, so that's why I'm on 4 Chance Ray. Well, you're certainly safe from Thermokarst and Stone Rain at this time in Popper's history. Maybe not Wildfire. Maybe not Wildfire. Yeah, you might get Cleansing Wildfire. Do that. It seems likely, but again, you do have Prohibited in your main deck, so not. And sometimes, you know, the Cleansing Wildfire player has kept a hand where they just have to Wildfire their own land because they kept a two-land hand that was reliant on that ramp and or color fixing. So not even in permutations where you play against Cleansing Wildfire, you're not guaranteed to get got. So... I wanted to ask you to elaborate on something you mentioned in your explanation, and that was that you prefer Ponder over Brainstorm. Why is that? So, before the event, I was testing with Kali for about two weeks, and he was trying out Brainstorm, since there was somebody on our testing team who was also trying out Brainstorm. When I was testing it, it felt fine, but I kind of came to the conclusion that cantrips are mostly there to set up our early game and not exactly our later game since our late game is perfectly fine with how much card draw we have so that's why i like ponder more than brainstorm brainstorm isn't really a, a card you can afford to be playing turn one maybe turn two but turn one you usually want to be playing a cantrip and that's mostly why why i play ponder since it's just a better turn one play irrefutably so doesn't have any potential downsides. Or rather, the only potential downside is the one land ponder based keep and uh oh, I have to shuffle, good luck me situation. But that's still certainly better than one land brainstorm, uh oh, I'm locked. So, yeah, yeah, ir yeah, it's just irrefutably true. Makes perfect sense. So, let's go ahead and continue into the cycle. Now, when Kelly was on the podcast, he was going so far as to splash a mountain and play Gorilla Shamans, right? We've already noticed that Thermocost is, the, the stock in Thermocost is at an all-time bottom. And, you know, coincidentally, the same is true for Gorilla Shaman. I see six remove artifact effects in your sideboard. Walk me through how you board versus affinity and why there is so much dedication to beating that deck in your sideboard. So I think to understand these cards, we gotta talk a little bit about the testing. So when I was testing, I was looking for ways to beat affinity because my prediction for the PTQ, I believe that the metagame is going to be mostly fairies and mostly affinity. Maybe some other deck, but mostly just those two. So, when I was testing, I was looking for ways to be affinity the best way. And I was not trying to evoke existence, but instead just trying for dust to dust. And I was not very impressed with it at first, so I tried cards like Drain of Nowhere. And those cards were pretty good. So, going into the event, I was thinking I was going to be playing Drain of Nowhere. But the day of the event, I woke up and I was like, screw it, I'm gonna play 4 Dust to Dust, 2 Revoke Existence, I hope I do not lose 2 Affinity. So, I actually did not lose 2 Affinity at all, I beat it 4 times, so the tech worked. And uh, yeah, so that's mostly why I played those. And for sideboarding, Kelly had this uh, sideboarding guide, sort of, where he would cut all the high cost cards and all the late, where the cards to keep you alive, since you don't really need to stay alive, you more have to just cheese them out. So. We cut three deep analysis, four faithful, one prohibit, and one e truth, and we brought in the four dust to dust, two revokes, and the three blue mental blast, and that plan worked out pretty well. And it seems like something else that worked out for you is the inclusion of the blue monarch in your sideboard, and I do believe that is in the place of a flex spot. Could you walk me through what that comes in against and why you chose it? Yeah, so the fairies matchup, I kind of came to the conclusion that I was mostly just losing to Monarch. So, to beat Monarch, you must also have the Monarch. So, why not play Monarch? My ideology behind the card was pretty somewhat simple. Uh, you play your own Monarch and you can steal it since it basically has flavor text saying that it can't be blocked by creatures the Monarch controls. So, even if your opponent does get Monarch, you can trade the Monarch back and forth, which makes it somewhat fair considering you can just draw into card advantage and just help grind them um additionally you can also play like ephemerates or ghosty flickers on your azure fleet on your opponent's turn and get back the monarch so they don't draw a card which actually came up a couple times and uh yeah it worked out pretty well 
Uh, it's also just a mo uh, must kill card, since if they don't kill it, you just keep getting back the Monarch. And uh, yeah, the card was just pretty bonkers uh, all day for whenever I played it. I was quite impressed with it. So the last card I want to touch on in the sideboard is something that doesn't really seem to be a flex spot in so much as it's usually somewhere in the 75 cards. But at this time, it's in the sideboard, and that is Sage's Row Denison. Can you explain to anyone looking to pick up this deck for the first time why that card's in the sideboard and what its applications are? Sure. So, Sage Row Denison is mostly a main deck card, specifically for the fact that it's a way to not time out on Magic Online and just to comp somebody out. But I'm a fan of not having very many dead cards in my main deck. And I think Sage Row Denison is a dead card a lot of time. Because if you draw in your opener, you really don't want to see it in your opener. It has certain applications against certain matchups. And I think the most prevalent matchup where you want it is definitely Tron. Tron's a deck that usually outvalues you. You usually have to combo them out in some way, which is why I have Sage Row Denison in the sideboard. Additionally, it's also, just, it's also good against just like decks like Pestilence or Boros Monarch, where the games just go on for so long where you probably need the Sigil anyways to not time out. So that's mostly why I have in the sideboard. Okay, thank you for that explanation. So I feel like the obvious answer to this is going to be Affinity, but traditionally I do ask guests to tell me what decks they want to play against and what decks they don't want to play against. Could you walk me through those? Yeah, so... My sideboard was specifically teched for two decks, and those were Fairies and Affinity. I was not sure how the Affinity matchup was going to be, but after facing it in round three, it felt pretty, pretty good. So I was pretty happy to play against it after that. And yeah, Fairies, just because I had a lot of tech for that matchup. Additionally, Burn's a great matchup. Aggro decks are pretty good, even though I don't have that much anti-aggro. And uh, other mid-range piles are pretty good matchups as well. So the field was looking pretty good. For familiars, I was just hoping to not face decks that are like hyper aggro, like walls, boggles, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, it did work in my favor. So there's that. Please say slivers. Go ahead, because I think we we, we, we both we both know how this goes. What I I was gonna lose the slivers. <laughs> no, no, no. It should be on your list. Like I actually like so. Oh no! It's not. It's not a fair matchup, actually. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, like, hilariously bad. It's, like, one of those, like, there's only a handful of matchups that are just, like, hilariously lopsided for slivers. Usually, you're the underdog. Like, we don't we don't have any stone horns or anything. Like. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, especially at this time. Yeah, you're on the, you're off the stone horn ephemerate builds of uh, literally yesteryear at this point. It's just funny to me because, I mean, you've played slivers as well. In fact, um, you're the only guest that I've played popper with in a physical setting we've battled it out at a grand prix side events and in an, an ironic twist of fate you were the slivers player that day and i had azorius chancery i believe yeah i think you're you're playing is it just guy femory is that what you're playing yeah 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 because your your japanese cards came in that day and you're like i'm gonna play this yeah good times yeah yeah that was when we were working on the uh the naya slivers list and I was like pretty new to Popper. I was like a couple of months back into the format. And I was like, eh, I'll play it. Why not? And uh, I got absolutely destroyed because Sprawling Sandstorm is a magic card. Well, hey, man. I uh, I main decked it for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's all right. It's okay. I got I got absolutely wrecked. It was what, uh, 80 or 100 card teachings got the better of me? Yeah, I think it was, uh, it was like a 100 card Soul Tide teachings, right? I think, it was, I think it was Soul Tie. Oh, yeah. Because Sprout Swarm was his only green card. So you're right. That's how he beat me. So you're right. It's Soul Tie teachings. But yeah, it turns out uh, I got my uh, Kermuffins because Swirling Sandstorm. Not so good against 80 to 100 card teachings. <laughs> that, that might be true. Hey, I at least went 2 1 in that side event. So I'm happy with that. Yep. Same over here. Like I said, I got. Uh, well, you know. When you're playing hard control against hard control and the other opponent can just deck you as a backup plan, oh, it's uh, not good. It's, it's not good. <laughs> that guy literally had like the most expensive of each card and he was just like flexing the entire time. Yeah, that was the only pomper deck I've ever seen that was worth 
What, what would you say? A modern deck, maybe? Uh, I'd probably put it in like the, uh, probably on like the six hundred dollar range, around there. Yeah, I think that's. Well, you know, maybe modern decks may have been maybe more now since when I last played modern. It's been about four years since I played modern. The average price for a deck was seven, eight hundred dollars then. Or yeah, they're all now like a hundred or like they're like one k plus now. Okay, well, never mind that. Well, okay, so he still the nicest popper deck ever. Yeah, most expensive version of everything. I actually had the pleasure of losing to that gentleman three times over the weekend with uh, different decks each time from my my end of things. The same deck for, from him. So I got the same business over and over again. And the best part of it is in my Grand Prix side event popper history that year, I actually went X and three. So that guy really got me. That guy really had my number apparently soul tie teachings is just a broken deck you know what it seems just fine in like a side event like you're gonna go play some some popper side events at grand prix las vegas what are you gonna bring to battle well probably the obvious uh definitely familiars because familiars is a great deck i don't know maybe, maybe tron or something else but right now it's definitely familiars because i have that build already i'm not sure about what else i want to bring though i have to think about it maybe slivers maybe slivers yeah, I mean, if you bring Tron, you would be the first person I've seen play Tron at a Grand Prix Popper side event in some time. And we'll just we'll just throw that out there for the competitive level of Popper Grand Prix side events, um, which is great because, like, I played four different decks, right, in the four different events that I went to. And I would encourage you to do the same. I would encourage you just to, like, you know, roll the dice, essentially, have a good time. And uh, it's not like you're playing for, you know, too much. Yeah. Yeah, I mostly just play for funsies. Side event. It's a side event. It's not the not the actual Grand Prix. So, but let's walk through your PTQ win. What did you play against that day? So round one, I'm against Black Fairies. Uh, I know this opponent, so kind of do what they're playing, and I see that the mole into four. It's not good. So it's pretty easy game one. I cast a bunch of mole drifters. My opponent cannot counter them, and I won. There's not not a whole lot to say there. Opponent's on a mole into four, so. Uh, game two, my opponent board in Stormbound Geist, which I found kind of weird, but uh, I lost anyways because I got mana screwed. I was stuck on four lands, and opponent had Monarch, so I kind of lost that one. Game three, my opponent passed turn one on accident. Not good, and uh, may have cost him the game, and uh, I got Drift Ephemerate, Mancer Online, and uh, kind of won that game. Uh, I sideboarded, and this is how I'm going to sideboard for most of the Fairies games. Uh, I cut two Ponders. Two snap, one echoing truth, and I brought in three Azure Fleet into Dispel. I cut the ponders and snaps, mostly because this is more of a grindy matchup where you don't exactly need the cantrips, and snaps are not great against snuff out, so that's why I did that sideboarding. Game or round two, I'm gonna get some mono green. Uh, I assumed my opponent was on blue backed over since that's what they have played in the past, but they sometimes play mono green, and I was not expecting that. So uh, game one, I kept a, a hand that was good against blue black, but not exactly a hand that was good against Stompy. Uh, it consisted of a Chancery, Ash Barons, Mole Drifter, Preordain, Mortray Mire, Secret Oracle, and Island. The hand was pretty slow, obviously, so I was kind of hoping that it would work out after I saw Basic Forest and. Uh, I somehow was able to win that game, so yeah, I got the faithful, and uh, yeah, I won it. Uh, game two, I got absolutely demolished. I kept a really, really risky hand that had a one lander, but it had faithful and a cantrip. So I was just praying to the magic gods that I would get the the planes and somehow win. I did not. I got kind of demolished. Game three, I kept. Uh, kind of a risky hand. It had a familiar Ash Barons, two Islands, Mole Drifter, and a Mortuary Mire. The reasoning that I kept this hand was on the back of Mortuary Mire itself. If the Mortuary Mire was something else, I probably wouldn't keep it, but I was able to jam a turn two familiar, evoke Mole Drifter, put it back on top. I found the right cards at the right time, and uh, yeah, I won that one. And I sideboarded by cutting all the deep analysis. I brought in Cedar Road Denizen. Kind of a weird card to bring in, but I kept it in because it just blocks a lot of things. And I also brought in Revoke Existence, since I don't really have that many cards to bring in, but it can get rid of Rancor or an Elephant Guide. So, that's the reason that I brought those cards in. Uh, round 3, I'm against Affinity. This is an opponent that I have tested with in the past. 
So I wasn't sure what they were on at first. I kind of assumed they were on a deck that I've seen them play before, like Fairies or Jund, but they were not there on Affinity. My opponent kept a very, very slow hand game one, and their only threat was just the Atog. So I got Mancer Ephemerate and Snap Online, and they conceded. So pretty easy game one. Game two, I kept a hand with no Dust to Dust, but it had the absolute nut draw of Familiar, Snap, Balance Land. So I get a really fast start going on there. Uh, my opponent kept a two lander with double Atog. Not very scary, but I played a Ponder and I got Dust to Dust plus Revoke Existence and one. How I sideboarded for every affinity match is I cut well, I guess I already said it, but I'll just reiterate it. Uh, I cut all the Faithfuls, I cut the Deep Analysis, uh, Echoing Truth, and one Prohibit, brought in four Dust Dust, two Revokes, and three Blue Mental Blast. Round four, I am against Affinity again, and this is a pretty good friend of mine, so I am actually knew he was on Affinity. I'm all to five, but my opponent kept the two lander, so that gave me enough time to get the familiar and get Mancer Ephemerate online. Uh, I ephemerate my Drifters a few times to find a flicker for infinite life. I didn't find it, but I still won the game because I had enough cards in hand. Or I kept another opener, game two, with no Dust to Dust, but had cantrips and had familiar. I found a Dust to Dust off a of Ponder, just like in round three, and I got the second white source. I killed two of their lands. They missed their fourth land drop, so they were stuck with one land. They eventually got the fourth, but then I got Mancer in play with Ephemerate and Dust to Dust, and they were dead because I just kept exil exiling their lands. Round 5, we are against Affinity again. Uh, this time it's actually just Red Black Affinity instead of the usual stock version. Game 1, I kept a reasonable hand. Wasn't that great, but uh, my opponent never drew the A-Tuck that I needed to win, and their only threat was just an Enforcer. So, I got Snap, Archaemancer, and Ephemerate online, and won the game. Uh, game 2, I kept a pretty insane hand since it had Familiar, Snap, and a Bounce Land. Also had some Cantrips and a Mole Drifter, so this hand was looking great. I was not really expecting to lose with this hand to be honest, since this is kind of the no draw. But, I actually never found the Dust to Dust. Uh, I got Double Duress, which kind of killed me a little bit. And I whiffed off uh, Flickering 2 Secret Oracles, and I only found 2 lands. And then my opponent killed me with the Sightbull plus Atog. So, kind of a sad game there. But game three, got a chance to win this one. Uh, I kept an opener with Revoke Ex Existence, Dust to Dust, but it only had two lands. So at this point, I'm kind of hoping that I draw the third land so I can evoke a Mole Drifter and try to find the second white source that I needed to win. I drew a Vaughn Miles off the top of my deck. I evoked the Mole Drifter. I then Dust to Dusted them. I revoked them. They missed their land drop, and I won. So pretty easy game three as well. Round six, not a whole lot to say here. I'm against Blue Black Fairies, and unfortunately, I got down paired. So, for those of you who don't know, if you get down paired, your breakers get a lot, lot worse. So, if I lose this game, I'm kind of forced to win out the event, or win out the rest of the Swiss. And, of course, I get kind of destroyed. <laughs> game one, my opponent played turn four Monarch. I lost. Game two, my opponent played turn four Monarch, and I lost. I never got to play Azure Fleet Admiral, so. Yeah, I kind of lost that one. Round 7, and this is where I get hello lucky. I get paired against Burn. So, uh, I have to win the next two rounds. This is an 8 round event. Uh, I'm currently 5-1, and one, so I have to be 7-1 and one to get the top 8. I get paired against Burn. And I knew my opponent was automatically on Burn since they mostly play Rune. And uh, I kept a hand with a Godfather's Faithful. So, hopefully I can get there. My opponent, I'm at 5. My opponent has a Curse of the Pierced Heart. In play and their last card in hand is a fire blast my opponent decides to fire blast me so i'm at one life and i am dead on my upkeep luckily for me however i have a snap in my hand and i have two god fearless faithfuls so i snap a faithful i go up to three and i'm not dead to the curse my opponent also has zero lands now so pretty easy to win this game i play my faithful i play a game answer i cast a bunch of spells gain a bunch of life my opponent cannot burn me out in time and they're dead game two I kept a double God for his faithful hand, which are the best hands, but I had no card advantage or counters though, which is not exactly where you want to be. Um, I draw prohibit off the top, which is pretty good. My opponent plays a firebrand archer, I snap it, and I'm kind of hoping I can time walk them if they cast it again. Get cast it at prohibit, gain a couple life, I basically time walk them. Pretty good. 
then I draw Mancer Ephemerate because I'm lucky like that, and I win the game. Uh, I cut all my deep analysis, I cut one flicker because I think it's just too slow in the matchup, uh, a secret oracle, even though in retrospect I don't think that was really correct, and I brought in two dispel, three blue mental blast. So now all I have to do is win the next game, or win the next round, that's all I have to do, and hope that we get paired into the right matchup. And thank you, wizards, for pairing me into burn in round eight. Uh, this guy literally only plays burn and popper. I know what he's on. I just have to get there. I kept a decent hand with a familiar and a counter, so I'm hoping that he tries to kill my familiar. I counter, and then I hope that he tries to kill it again. Luckily, that's what happens, so there's not two bullets going on my face. Uh, I got faithful online, and all I need to do at this point was just to dodge fire blast for one turn because he didn't have it last turn, and I just need to dodge it for this turn only. But they top decked it, and I lost. So I have to win the next two to get in the top eight. Game two, I kept kind of a risky hand. Uh, it had no faithful, and it didn't do anything until turn three, but um, I was on the play, so I was hoping that it would work out. Uh, my opponent also kept a slow hand, so best case scenario for me. Uh, I had two fams, and then I drew another one, and luckily for me, they killed all of them. And, uh, yeah, then I got Ephemerate and Archamancer. I found a counter, and, uh, I won. So, at this point, we just have to win game three. This is, like, the most important game that I'm mostly I'm playing for. So, game three comes. I kept an opener with Faithful, a counter, and card advantage. But I'm on the draw, which is the scariest thing against Burn. My opponent goes to spend turn one Rift Bolt. So, I could play my Faithful turn one, or I could not play it. I have an option. I decided to not cast the faithful. I feel like I'm going to win this game by having the faithful in play. So I decided to not play it. He bolts me and doesn't really do anything. He also suspends Rift Bolt turn two. So again, same thing. I don't cast my faithful. He bolts me, whatever. And I go down to seven. My opponent has three cards in hand. So there's a chance that I'm just dead next turn. Uh, I have my faithful out. I have a counter in hand. Really hoping that I can get there. My opponent doesn't kill me. Thank God. I play Secret Oracle. I found a Dispel. I played Ephemerate on the Secret Oracle. Got an Ephemerate. I know. I got a Faithful. And then I got a Mancer. And I won the game. So, I'm locked in a top 8 now. It's pretty good. In top 8, I am somehow the first seed. I don't know how when I got a pair down, but whatever. In the quarterfinals, I get paired against Blue Black Fairies. Uh, my opponent is a well-known fairies player, and I kind of assumed they were on some kind of fairy fairy variant. My opponent didn't get Monarch that game, so we're in game one, which is the best case scenario. And I got three mole drifters, so I just kept jamming them, and they didn't counter them, or they didn't counter one of them. And uh, I just kept jamming stuff, and then I won. So, pretty easy game one there. Uh, game two, my opponent had turn four Monarch, but... Azure fleet off the top, because I'm lucky, and I stole the Monarch, and then I just suicided some creatures to get the Monarch for a couple turns, and uh, I couldn't keep Monarch, and I somehow won the game. My opponent probably made a mistake that game, that most likely cost them the game, and that play was not cracking the Relic of Progenitus while I had our commands on the stack, because when it comes down, they can crack their Relic, but I can Ephemerate in response and get back the card that I wanted to get back, which... They end up cracking it when my Archimancer came down, so they got punished pretty hard because I was able to get back Prohibit and just Ephemerate lock them. So, so yeah, semi-vinyls against another Fairy player. Going in to top 8, I realized, so to get into the Pro Tour, you have to be 18. And I am 17, and at the time of this PTK I was 16, so I could not play in it. I, the, the DEC, the uh, Digital Event Coordinator, told us that we could split in the semis since the first and second place both get the invite. I offered to my opponent a split, but they declined. So, we played it out. Game one, I got a fem on Resolve Drifter, and I he won the stack battle, because I was trying to go for a stack battle there just to make him run out of cards. But uh, I top deck another Mole Drifter. He counters it, sure. But lucky me, I'm just being an absolute luck sack. I drew a Ponder. Yeah, I got a land, sadly, but then I top deck Deep Analysis, which is my absolute best draw here. Uh, I got a Mancer, and then I prohibit, so I countered their counter. And then I got a Femurite Lock going, and I won. Game 2, my opponent had a turn 4 Monarch. I got mana screwed. It is what it is. Monarch is stupid. Uh, game 3, my opponent was stuck on 3 lands, 
with no black source, which is the best case scenario against the black fairies. I just played Mo Drifter, Flicker two Mo Drifters, and won the game. It was glorious. And we're in the finals, so now I'm actually qualified for the Pro Tour. There's no reason to play this one out. This is probably my favorite match of the day. The finals do not matter, because the first first player and the second place player get the exact same prize. They both get the invite, they both get the same Magic Online prizes. There's no real reason to play this game out, except for glory. But familiars, you know, that, does, that deck doesn't get a whole lot of postings, unless you're Cali, who only gets the postings. So... I say they want to scoop to me so I can get the glory. They don't. We play it out. This game is probably the best game of the day because of game three. But we'll get there. I was playing horrendously bad at this point because I was not playing for anything. Because one, I can't go to the pro tour. And two, we're already invited. So uh, I punched away game one pretty hard uh, by not holding up a counter spell when I needed to. Got kind of Got kind of destroyed there. But game two... I kept a hammer dust dust and double white source. I draw revo revoke existence. I exile his third land and he doesn't draw the fourth and then concedes after a few turns. So now we're just playing for all the glory. Uh, game three, I keep another opener with dust to dust, but it has five lands and a ponder. And I'm hoping that this ponder is good. Uh, I find a preordain and a blue mental blast. Those are fine. Hopefully I can get the right cards off that. Um, I try to resolve a drifter since I have a step in my hand, but he has pyro plus a Dispel for my uh, Blue Mental Blast. At this point though, his only cloud sources are one Chromatic Star, two Great Furnaces, and two Dark Steel Citadels, so I'm not really worrying a whole lot. Uh, I draw another Drifter, he Pyro Blasts it, and the only card in my hand right now is Snap. He's in top deck mode, I'm also in top deck mode, he has an Atog though, so there's a chance that I just die this Atog. I draw Dust to Dust, and I exile his two red sources, since he already used his Chromatic Star. And I snap his Atox, so he can't cast anymore. Uh, after that, he passes, I draw Secret Oracle, I get Arcane Mancer, and I get Dust to Dust, because that was two other lands. He keeps whiffing on any kind of land. And then I draw Snap, I snap my Mancer, play Mancer, Dust to Dust, and he concedes, and I win the Pro Tour, the Pro Tour Qualifier. And uh, the end of the, <laughs> the end of this game was glorious. Uh, I have a bunch of stuff in play, and he just has two disciples in Icar Wellspring. <laughs> oh, Dust of Dust is a silly card. But yeah. Speaking of Dust of Dust being a silly card, and speaking of shaping the metagame, you missed out on top sixteen today in the challenge on breakers, but you did get the five zero league posting, and we have seen some traction on popper social media circles of a certain screenshot of the dust of dusts now being in the main deck tell me about that tell me about that oh so uh me and raptor 56 a past guest on the podcast uh we were kind of uh memeing in the leagues if you will and i've been known to play tech in boros bully I've done this a few times in the past. Uh, the most popular one being Boros Bully with four Pyroblast main deck. And uh, we kind of came to the conclusion that leagues are just affinity at this point. And if you, your fa your fairies matchup is already great as Bully. So all I have to do is just play four Dust of Dust and destroy affinity. And in matchups where, du where Dust of Dust is bad, you can just looting them away. Which is the upside of playing it in Bully. And uh, yeah, we got three decks with artifact lands. And uh... I won those, and then I beat Fairies, and I beat Burn. So, right now, the metagame is kind of stale. It's mostly just Fairies and Affinity at this point. Like, a different deck comes up every week. Maybe it's Boggles, maybe it's Stompy, or something else. But, right now, it's just Affinity and Fairies for the most part. And it really just... I, I'm, I've not been a huge fan of Popper as of late. Uh, I'm sorry if this turns to like, a rant or whatever. Like a hell cell moment. But, uh... I don't know. Uh, Affinity feels kind of kind of broken right now. Uh, it has basically Ancestral Recall with Daily Dispute plus Sacred Wellspring. And the bridges, or the bridge cycle, allows it to uh, beat its past natural predator being Gorilla Shaman. So now you're kind of forced to play cards like Dust to Dust, which were, not, were cards that were never played a while ago. But now they're, now they're like must-includes and basically every deck that plays white and uh 
It's not great, because now the only way to beat Affinity is to just cheese out Affinity. Fairies right now is kind of kind of broken as well, I think, because it's a deck that relies so heavily on Monarch, where you can just jam turn 4 Monarch and just snuff out your opponent's board, and you just draw too many cards and win the game. Now, is that more on the Fairies deck itself, or is it on Monarch? It's probably a Monarch, because Monarch is a silly mechanic that should just not exist in 1v1. So, yeah. Uh, the metagame right now is pretty pretty inbred i'd say it's uh, it's not pleasurable you mentioned your opponent made a mistake in not cracking his relic of Petranus when he had an opportunity to do so a previous guest on this podcast would question the effectiveness of relic in general in that person's sideboard so ultimately is relic an effective card against familiars and should people be sideboarding it in against you well just as ineffective as it is against tron uh i believe that it is uh, quite ineffective against familiars familiars has more angles of attack than just your graveyard and you can always just t play a bunch of more drifters and attack that way or you can just wait to draw a bunch of flicker effects like ephemerates or ghostly flickers in which case it kind of makes the uh the real progenitor just quite bad because you can play your Arcane Mancer, and let's say they crack it, and now you just flick your Arcane Mancer a bunch of times, and then they get kind of blown out. So, uh, yeah, just as, as ineffective as it is against Tron, I, I'd say it's not great versus Familiars either, even though people love their relics. Oh, well, I mean, turn one, who can beat it? Get it down early? Get that nice board coverage? See, it, it, not only does it provide board coverage in being a permanent, that you can spend time tapping, but when you tap it, it has graveyard coverage. Oh yeah, it has clock coverage. You know what? All right. So, real, 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 t real talk. I have brought in relic to time people <laughs> up before. <laughs> well, been a been a minute, been a minute. But yeah, ugh. actually, the first time I ever made top eight of, uh, I think. Yeah, I think the top, first time I ever made top eight of the challenge was with Boros Bully, and I think I had like one relic in that sideboard just because like I copied a list and then like changed like one or two cards or whatever. You know what I mean? And like uh, I had I had like a relic in the sideboard, and I remember distinctly like in like round two in game one, my opponent's clock slid below fifteen minutes on his side of things. And I'm like, this is game one. I'm just gonna time this guy out. Like regardless of what happens. Like, I'm just going to time this guy out, you know? And then sure enough, we're playing game three, and there's like three minutes or three and a half minutes to like at the start of it, and I'm like, this, this relic in my sideboard is looking mighty fine right now. <laughs> and I brought, I brought it in just shamefully, just shamefully, and it's like, yep, turn one relic, go, upkeep. <laughs> <laughs> You, you know, quite fittingly, I basically have the exact same story that you do. Because my second challenge ever, I made top 8 with Boros Bully. And it is probably the worst bully list I have ever played ever. But I had two relics. And this is before I knew better that relic is a terrible card and you probably shouldn't be playing it. And I was against Modern Monkey on Tron. And <laughs> I'm sorry, Modern Monkey. <laughs> but I timed him out. <laughs> I didn't feel bad at the time, but in retrospect, I definitely do, because <laughs> that's just scummy, but, oh wait, no, it was, uh, it was round 7, not top 8, because I was playing for top 8, that's right, like, I destroyed my, my pro will in top 8, I'm sorry, Modern Monkey, <laughs> I had to do it too, I was doing, like, the, I was doing, like, the scummy stuff too, with, like, casting strands in response to garbage, <laughs> uh. <laughs> such a scumbag, <laughs> Yeah, no, it's funny. It's funny how much value sometimes we place in things in moments. Yeah, like, I was like, oh, man, top eight. That's, like, so much moto money. I mean, ultimately, a, root, a lot of the the root cause to a lot of that is just simply validation. And the difference between making top eight and not making top eight is literally everything in the Magic community. And this podcast is guilty of that same logic, that same glorification of survivor's bias. Thoroughly so.
but the premise was not false that I started the podcast on. The premise, of course, the 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 implication, if I'm if I want to speak to the people who are shaping the metagame, is that not all opinions are equal. So that I think is still a fine premise, but unfortunately, just plucking the winner every week isn't always the best window into that. But yeah, you know, whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a morals thing. Like, do you do you let them have it, the fair W, or do you just try to scum out? But, I mean, it is how it is, I guess. You just gotta get used to it, like I have. Yeah, my scumming days are behind me, I believe. But, uh, you know, the you know I'm also just fortunately in a position where the number of empty Joe chests I win in, in a year does not have bearing. So, whereas in previous years, that was not true then, yeah, I mean, you know, you got to bring in that relic with three minutes left on the opponent's clock. I mean, it's round two. I'm up I'm up around, baby. <laughs> Sometimes you got to do what you got to do, all right? <laughs> just, <laughs> just get used to it. <laughs> well, let's move on into our recurring segments here on the podcast. Could you share with us what your play of the day was? All right. So there weren't very many uh, high technical plays, but I think this was a pretty interesting one, nonetheless. So I'm at, it's game one against Stoppy. I have three faithful in play. I'm at one life, and next turn I am probably dead, or at least going to a low life total if I don't draw the right cards. So I have the option here to cast Flicker on two islands or a seed oracle and the island. So here I actually decide to flicker on the two islands because if my opponent has vines of vastwood I'm dead the next turn. So I go up to uh, four and then I cast one drifter and then I ephemerate go up to ten and I actually went on to five and uh, I was able to win that game because they couldn't vines of vastwood me. Now I don't know if they had the vines of vastwood or not but uh I think the line was probably the best line it could have taken, considering that I could have just been dead next turn. So that was probably the play of the day. Always best to reduce your risk of ruin to the minimum, and we're available zero. So yeah, sounds pretty sweet. Can you go ahead and provide us with a silly slivers ability? You know, I had to think really hard about this one. All slivers have been vaccinated. My silly slivers ability... All slivers have a coupon for personal pizza, or rather, they will once they read their six books for the summer. A joke, of course, about the American elementary school summer program experience, really. But we do, of course, have an international audience with the podcast. So for our Brazilian listeners, all slivers have a scorpion in their pocket. For those of us not from Brazil, that scorpion prevents them from getting to their wallet. So, should you take a sliver to get coffee, well, you invited them. Of course, we do have listeners from Europe as well, and the largest group come from Italy. So, for them, all slivers have much better pizza. And reading is optional, no coupon required. Well, congratulations on your victory in the qualifier. I wish you the best of luck in the future when you are able to play on the Pro Tour. I hope you are able to qualify again and partake in that experience. Until then, well, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you, for Sal. It has uh, been an honor to join you today as I've been uh, watching slash listening to the podcast for a couple years now. So it's great to be on. Thank you for having me again. And thanks once more to my guest for coming on the podcast. It was a pleasure to do an episode, to talk Popper, and more specifically, to talk Popper with the next generation of magic talent, both competitively and in the content creation space, because let's be honest, it's October of 2021, not October of previous years. So... Chances are you've already seen some of his 
content. But if you haven't, go ahead and check it out. He streams on Twitch. He did a podcast with another previous guest of the podcast discussing this very deck. So if you are interested in the archetype, check them out. They have a Discord dedicated to the deck, and the link is in the description right next to the winning deck list. I would, of course, be remiss not to address that it has been some time since we've done an episode, and I would ask our longtime listeners to continue to maintain any expectations for the podcast. It is October, after all, so in the spirit of Halloween, consider this a ghostly flicker. In and out we go. And we'll see you the next time we enter the battlefield.